Okay, let's get started. Today we are going to talk about character tech. So, this is me, I'm Alan Noon, Senior Developer Relations Technical Artist with Epic Games. And I'm going to talk about two of the new features that are part of the new character tech framework that we have. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the new clothing simulation framework and associated tools. And then we're going to move on to immediate mode physics, which is the new physics solution that we have for characters. So uh, I'll give you sort of a history lesson on each of these features, kind of where we started, where we're at now, and where we're going to be going. And we'll show some basic workflow as well. All right, if we look over here at the editor, you might be familiar with this sample. This, this is the clothing sample as it stands in the content examples project that's available on our launcher. And you can see from left to right that we have some heavy leather, some rubber, more of a satiny or silk, and a burlap. So this was authored with the Apex clothing tool. And you can see some differences. Obviously the leather isn't reacting to the wind as much as some of the other materials. But as we get towards the end of the spectrum here, there's not a tremendous amount of difference. And I wanted to point that out because the new clothing framework exposes a wider variety of parameters that really allow you to dive in and dial in the particular cloth type effects that you want. Okay, the other motivation for coming up with the new clothing framework was our game Paragon. And if you're not familiar with Paragon, it's our triple A entry into the MOBA space. And it features a ton of characters. We have somewhere on the order of 15 to 20 characters now, and there's a new one every three weeks. And each of these characters has a number of accessories, lots of skirts, capes, hair, so on and so forth. And so now, let's take a look at one of these characters. This is Aurora, recently introduced. What a charming little world. I'll take it. Until next time. So as you noticed, she has a skirt hanging off of the back, a skirt hanging off from the side, and she has some simulation happening in the hair. Uh, today for the demo, we're just gonna focus on that side skirt. So, Currently, up to this point, when we were authoring cloth, this is what the pipeline looked like. Here. So we would author our geometry in a DCC app, such as Max or Maya, and bring it in via the FBX format. Then we would author the Apex file, which actually defined the cloth. And this could be done a couple of different ways. So there are plugins for Max and Maya that do this, and there's also the standalone tool that NVIDIA provides. But as we're creating these characters and constantly tuning them, we found ourselves spinning a lot of cycles in this loop here. Every time we wanted to make a change, it was back out to Apex, re-import, test, and so on. So we thought we could do better. So now the new pipeline is, we're still authoring the actual content in the DCC app, but the Apex portion, the cloth definition portion, happens all within the editor. So any iteration never has to leave the engine. Okay, so let's take a look at this character. I'm gonna jump back into the editor here. We'll go full screen. And over here on the right is Aurora as she appears in Paragon today. On the left is the exact same character prior to setup. 
you might notice the orange piece of, piece of geometry there. That's the simulation mesh that we're going to be using to drive the in-game mesh. So cloth is authored in the skeletal mesh editor, so I'm going to select this version of Aurora, open up the skeletal mesh editor here. All right, I made a point of this on the slide, this final point here. I wanted to point out how now when you click on the mesh within the skeletal mesh editor, this is a new feature, being able to specifically highlight particular mesh sections. These are basically the material IDs. It's a small thing. I've wanted this for a while. I'm super happy to see it in there. But what this allows us to do is actually select the different pieces of cloth here. All right, so if we go into wireframe mode, so what I've got selected now is that low resolution simulation mesh. You can see that it's evenly tessellated versus the in-game mesh here where we have some finer details. I want to point out this particular seam. Notice how fine that row of polygons is. That could potentially be problematic were we to simulate directly on this mesh. You know, when verts get that close and the mesh, the, the cloth is deforming, those verts could potentially collapse on themselves. So again, we use the lower res simulation mesh. Let's jump back and take a look at that. All right. So with the simulation mesh selected, I'm going to right click and directly in the viewport, I can create a new clothing asset. It'll give us a logical name, we can rename it if we like, and then we'll want to tick remove from mesh. This will hide the simulation mesh when it's actually in game. And next we want to pick a physics asset. We've already got one set up, the ice clothing asset here. And we'll go ahead and create that. But first, I'm going to jump out and take a look at what that physics asset looks like, just so you're familiar with it. So where normally our character has an entire rigid body setup for every single joint, for clothing, we want to simplify this as much as possible. So this particular physics asset only has five bodies, two on the lower legs, two on the upper legs, and we have the pelvis. Now, in Paragon, I believe we also do a little bit of simulation on the hair. Now, we could add rigid bodies up here, but that wouldn't be really the best practice because our cloth around the lower half of the character would still be calculating for the rigid bodies up top. So really what I'm offering here is a tip. If you have a character with several pieces of cloth across the, uh, across the entire character, I would say use multiple physics assets rather than create multiple physics bodies within one physics asset. A Couple of other things to quickly point out. The capsules are slightly larger than the actual mesh that they represent. This will decrease the likelihood of the cloth mesh actually crashing through the geometry. All right. There we go, let's catch up on our notes. Okay. So back to the skeletal mesh editor. Now I'm going to take our in-game cloth and associate it with the cloth that we've set up on that low-res mesh. So I'm going to apply the clothing asset. You can see the two pieces of clothing that we have here. This is the back skirt, which has already been set up, and this is the new piece that we just created. All right, so now that we have that association, we're going to need to paint some influences on the cloth so we can define how rigid or how flexible it is in the various areas. So we have a new tab here called Cloth Paint, and I'm going to enable these tools. And again, my two pieces of cloth that are set up, let's do the new one. And you can see we've duplicated the visualization from the Apex Cloth tool. So we have the typical tools that you might expect from painting weights. We can adjust brush size, fall off, and the strength. And I can go ahead and start painting influences. Now in this particular case, it's a fairly linear piece of geometry, so we have another tool that's a bit better suited for this task. So I'm gonna go ahead and zero this out and make it fully rigid again. And I will use the gradient tool. So the start of our gradient is gonna be the most stiff, and the end of the gradient is gonna be the most flexible. So I'll set that at 100. 
and then I'm going to check this box at the end, which is use regular brush. This allows us to paint the start and end of our gradient. So you see these green verts? That's the start. This is going to be our most stiff piece of cloth. Let's get up in here. That's probably pretty good. That should work. And then by clicking enter, the birds now turn red, and now I'm defining the most flexible bits. So we'll just hit these like so. And I am quickly rushing through this. But in a production environment, you'd probably want to spend more than 15 seconds. All right, so I hit enter again, and now those weights are blended. As soon as I leave paint tool mode, you can see that the in-game cloth is being simulated. All right, let's catch up. All right, let's take a look at the final result. So I'm going to click play. We'll go full screen. And there we go. So on the left, again, that was the character that we just set up. Now, obviously, a little more care was spent on the right-hand version that shipped in Paragon. But for a few minutes' work, that's not bad at all. And I'm just going to play a couple of animation, different animations so you can see it in action. And that's a pretty intense move and maintains itself fairly well. Mostly. <laughs> OK. So that is the new cloth. Let's move on to immediate mode physics. Okay, so the reasoning behind the new physics mode is twofold. So again, we have a lot of these characters, such as Feng Mao that you see here, who has any number of chains, long strips, his dangly bits, as I like to call them. Also, within the game itself, we would like to have more physical simulation. So as a character is animating and he's hit by some sort of force, we can blend in and out of a physics simulation. Now, we could do this today with our current implementation, but immediate mode physics is now more performant. All right, so yeah, let's talk about Anim Dynamics. This is our legacy solution that we're currently shipping with. So it did have some shortcomings. While it did work, it required quite a bit of maintenance. The actual setup for the dangly bits happens in the animation blueprint of the character, and it ended up being a ton of nodes that needed to be maintained within that graph. Each of those nodes has a wide number of settings that, could easily, uh, that are quite error prone and easily be misset. So looking at this chart here, in Anim Dynamics, we take all of our simulating characters and all of the physics calculation happens within one world. And then once all of that is resolved, we push the results back out onto the characters. So as you can see, there are two choke points within this graph that could potentially trip us up. With the new immediate mode physics, we run a very lightweight simulation on each individual character. Also, we get the advantages of our LOD system. So, in this graph here that we see, at the top LOD, we have all of the bodies within the character, within the physics asset. And as the character LODs out, we're dropping out uh, some of the, uh, the master set there. So again, this results in a performance boost as we're actually playing. So the setup is the same as it ever was. If you are familiar with our physics asset tool, this is Feng Mao and all of his glorious dangly bits. So if we go ahead and simulate these, you can see it's the exact same setup for immediate mode physics as it is for Anim Dynamics. All we have to do is take our rigid bodies and set them to simulate over here. All right, so if we go back, let's go ahead and play this. So again, on the left, Feng Mao as he exists today using Anim Dynamics, the old legacy system. On the right, not presently set up. Let's take a look at that animation blueprint I was talking about. So again, 37 nodes in this case that need to be maintained. 
And again, each one I select, tons of parameters that are error prone. So let's go ahead and set up Feng Mao again using our new system. So in his animation blueprint, we're just simply playing a jog. And now I'm going to add a rigid body node, wire that in, compile, and that's it. We've replaced all 37 of those nodes with one single node. Much easier, pardon me, much easier to maintain. All right. So again, if you recall the slide from a couple frames ago where we showed the single monolithic physics solution, it was very difficult to really dive in there and figure out where some of our simulation costs were. With the new immediate mode physics, as each character runs their own local simulation, it's much easier to isolate a hero and figure out where the costs are. And in general, we found it's a 2x speed up over Anim Dynamics. And everyone loves a good ragdoll demo, so obviously this means we can have more ragdolls in our game. So let's demo some of that. Okay, here in our scene, we have 20 minions from Paragon, and they've all randomly selected an animation to play, and then as soon as I hit them with the force, they go directly into ragdoll mode. So 20 ragdolls at once is pretty good, right? Yeah? Well, thanks to immediate mode, we can actually do quite a bit better. Here we have 500 minions, and we can start simulating them all over the place. Notice I'm bouncing off the walls there. And if I zoom in here and go into slow-mo, notice that we blend directly out of their animations into ragdoll mode as new immediate mode physics solver, uh, the animation blueprint now has direct access to the physics solver. All right, that's too much fun. Let's go ahead and do that again. There we go. Oh, not in slow mode. All right, too much fun. Okay. So the question becomes, when do you get access to this? It's presently in 4.16, which should be up on GitHub. The clothing tools themselves are marked as experimental. Uh, there's still some work to be done there, as you can see, but we would love for you to be able to go and download this and give us some feedback. Let us know what you'd like to see. And of course, Immediate Mode Physics, also in 4.16. So if you have any questions, I'll be off to the side here. Feel free to hit me up, but thank you very much.